Good afternoon, everybody. All right, very quick, as we get ready to head into Frankenstein, we're going to go over the historical background. We're covering a lot today. Uh, in order to get to Frankenstein, you got to go through Romanticism. In order to get to rom Romanticism, you've got to go through a lot of history, particularly the French Revolution. Hopefully, I will at least point out some of the big ideas and connect some of the dots. So here we go. Um, crash course on what we've done this school year so far. We started with Beowulf. We worked our way into Bede with the history of the English church and people. Then we entered into the medieval period where we read the Canterbury Tales. Then we got into the Renaissance where you've got Shakespeare and Hamlet. We moved into the Restoration with some of John Donne's poetry. And now we are going into the Romantic period. We just read The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. So let's uh, put some of this stuff into the historical literary context. The Romantic period from 1798 to 1832. As I said, the Romantic period is not necessarily connected with romance. Do not confuse romanticism period from 1792 to 1832. Don't confuse that with being romantic. Although the ideas are related, they're less alike than you probably realize. We just talked about John Donne's poetry, I love you like a compass. Uh, a flea is like our bodies intermingled. Um, not very romantic, but there are some very logical points that are connected there. The 18th century, so starting in 1701 and going through 1799, so going back a little ways, was a period of science and industry. Reason had become the main intellectual focus. Thought, reason, discovery, and it led to some cultural problems that many of the poets and writers tried to deal with. All right, so we got William Wordsworth here, and he says that humanity is unreasonable. The 18th century poems had celebrated the power of human understanding, but that hadn't led to a better world. People became disillusioned with the intellect as the supreme goal. By the late 1800s, nearly all the attitudes and tendencies of 18th century classicism and rationalism were defined or changed dramatically. So William's word, William Wordsworth, one of the poets and writers of this time period, he wrote this, he said, our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous form of things. We murder to dissect. We want to know how things work. We want to know what things are. We want to know what's going on. And in order to do that, we have to murder things, both literally by you know, killing animals and dissecting their, their bodies, but also metaphorically, if we look at the rhyme of the ancient mariner, the mariner literally murders the albatross, but symbolically he is destroying nature in this desire to explore the unexplored, to go and know the unknown. So on one hand, it's exciting to know this stuff and to learn this stuff. On the other hand, we just leave destruction in our wake. And that's how you get to this idea that humanity is unreasonable. Okay, so that takes us into the revolution. The French Revolution began on July 14, 1789. A mob stormed the Bastille, which is a French, uh, yeah, French, but it's a prison in Paris for political prisoners. The very famous phrase, liberty, equality, and fraternity was born out of this revolution, although the French make it sound much more elegant. So we have the storming of the Bastille, the successful revolutionaries placed limits on the power of King Louis XVI, established a new government, and approved a document called the Declaration of the Rights of Man of the Citizen. So there we got the storming of the Bastille, and this last picture is the storming of the Bastille as well. Here we have uh, an example of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, and then, of course, this idea of liberty, equality, and fraternity. 
France, after this revolution, became a constitutional monarchy. All right, so over in England, which was back to being a monarchy at this time, the ruling class felt threatened by the events in France, which seemed to strike at the roots of social order. The French Revolution, the common man overthrew the power. The common man figured out that, hey, if we band together, then we can literally change our worlds. Most intellectuals, including such important writers, such as William Wordsworth, at first were enthusiastic about this revolution and the democratic ideals on which it was based. William Wordsworth here wrote this poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. All right, back to the French Revolution, we have what was called the Reign of Terror. What a great picture uh, with the soldiers all lined up, people in the streets, but there in the center, you've got the guillotine. As royalists, moderates and radicals jockeyed for power. The French Revolution became more and more chaotic. In 1792, France declared war against Austria and Prussia, touching off an invasion by troops from those countries. Fuming with patriotic indignation, a radical group called the Jacobians gained control of the French Legislative Assembly, abolished the monarchy, and declared the nation a republic. That's great if you love the idea of democracy. Mobs attacked and killed many prisoners, including former aristocrats and priests, in the bloody September massacres. What you have is this idea of a bunch of people rising up and killing all the rich people, the rich and powerful people. All right, within weeks, the revolutionaries had tried and convicted Louis XVI on a charge of treason and sent him to the guillotine. The Jacobians, under the leadership of Maximilien de Robespierre, then began what is called the Reign of Terror. Over the course of about a year, they sent some 17,000 royalists moderates, and even radicals to the guillotine, including, finally, Robespierre himself, which is rather ironic, the guy who kind of led this thing, also ultimately got his head chopped off by the guillotine. They called the guillotine the National Razor. It became a symbol of the revolutionary cause, and the symbol was strengthened when the executions of the king and, of course, Queen Marie Antoinette happened. You might know the name Marie Antoinette as the woman who said, let them eat cake. I believe, and don't quote me on this because I'm not a great historical expert, the context was that she, she was told the poor are hungry and they have no bread, and then she said, well, let them eat cake, showing that she was clearly out of touch with the poor. If they can't afford bread, how are they going to afford cake? But she didn't get that. And if you look at the news just today, there was a comment about Ivanka Trump and her insensitivities to the current political situation and how a picture she posted is similar to the let them eat cake mentality. Someone who's a upper class rich aristocrat being completely out of touch with the working class. All right, so at the same time, France's new citizen army was making war across Europe in the name of liberty. In 1793, France declared war on Britain, thus beginning a series of wars that would drag on for 22 years. So we've got the French Revolution, and now we've got wars with England as well as other wars going on around. We've got this uh, impressive illustration here. This is an image that was taken from the Battle of Trafalgar, the artist here is J. M. W. Turner. This was painted uh, in 1805 or thereabouts. The Battle of Trafalgar was a naval engagement fought by the British Royal Navy against the combined fleet of the French and Spanish navies during the Napoleonic Wars, which lasted from 1803 to 1815. 27 British ships uh, defeated 33 French and Spanish ships. So the British were outnumbered, but they still defeated the French. So we've got uh, the Trafalgar, the battle, or, the battle at Trafalgar, which if you've ever been to London, you might actually recognize. Whoops, too 
fast. Trafalgar Square. Okay, so we got Trafalgar Square. The British reaction, the September massacres and the reign of terror were so shocking that even those Britons who had sympathized with the French Revolution now turned against it. The idea of democracy was great, but then it became so violent that the British were like, whoa, I don't know if we want to be a part of that. Conservative Britons demanded a crackdown on reformers who they denounced as dangerous J Jacobians. Remember, the Jacobians were... Uh, partly responsible for the French Revolution. Adding to British alarms was the success of France's new citizen army, which had expelled the Austrian and Russian invaders, those Prussians that we mentioned, and then set out to liberate other European nations from despotic rule. So this <laughs> citizen army basically says, if you have a dictator or a monarchy, we're going to come and we're going to kick that person out of power and let the people have the rule. So, of course, that made the English, who were just a tiny, tiny hop, skip, and a jump across the English Channel, they're only a tiny bit away from France, from France. Um, it made the English a little bit worried. All right, take a tiny little break here for a related reading context. Charles Dickens wrote A Tale of Two Cities, which is about this very time period. British leaders did not want France or any other nation to win dominance on the European continent. The Tory government, led by William Pitt the Younger, outlawed all talk of parliamentary reform outside the halls of parliament, banned public meetings, and suspended certain rights. Liberal-minded Britons had no political outlet for their hopes and dreams. Many turned to literature and art instead. Although it wasn't written during this time period, it was written some years later, Charles Dickens wrote a tale of two cities about this time in history, which of course two of its most famous line, the beginning and the end, the beginning being this, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And it continues, and then it ends with this absolutely gorgeous line, it is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. All right, moving us into the Napoleonic Wars. You might recognize Napoleon. No, oh, not that Napoleon. There we go. That's our Napoleon. Britain's battles with France took a new turn after 1799, when a military leader named Napoleon Bonaparte seized control of France. Napoleon had grandiose plans for French expansion, and he was a brilliant military leader. Napoleon, who had declared himself emperor of France, planned an invasion of Britain but he had to abandon the plan after the Battle of Trafalgar, which we talked about moments ago. Napoleon's armies had fought well against Britain's European allies, however, and by 1807, they controlled almost all of Europe, as far east as the borders of Russia. In 1812, Napoleon finally overextended himself by invading Russia. There, his armies were defeated by a combination of harsh winters and the strategic retreats of Russian armies which involved the destruction of goods and property that the French might use. Napoleon found himself down but not out, at least for a while. He was sadly and terribly exiled to the land of Elba, the island of Elba. Napoleon's forces were also defeated in the Peninsular War in Portugal and Spain. And in 1814, British and Allied armies closed in on him and forced him to abandon his throne. He was exiled to the Mediterranean island of Elba, where he plotted his return. And in 1815, Napoleon escaped back to France. He resumed his rule for a period known as the Hundred Days, but he finally met his last defeat at the Battle of Waterloo, which was in Belgium in 1815. His victorious opponent was the Duke of Wellington, the British hero of the Peninsula War. All right, so a history of a lot of war, a lot of uprisings, a lot of upheaval, a lot of bloodshed. And of course, we had the Industrial Revolution, which is a part of all this. Throughout the long wars with France, Britain's government ignored the problems caused by the Industrial Revolution. Overcrowded factory towns, unpleasant and unsafe working conditions in the factory, 
and long working hours for low pay. Once again, if you read any of Dickens, he'll talk all about this stuff. Uh, the working class grew steadily larger and more restless. They were forced to work for 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Children were, although they were employed technically, most more likely they were enslaved. Um, so in the factory towns of Northern England, workers protested in the violent Luddite riots of 1811 and 1813. They protested that they were losing jobs to robots, well, not robots, but machines and robotic mechanisms. Uh, and some attempted to organize into unions. Just as a side note, it seems like we're often having the same kind of issues. I mean, isn't this what people are talking about in politics today, of how we're losing our jobs to robots and machinery? All right, during this time, we also had the railroad which had its beginnings in the early 19th century. It was to change the face of a nation. Businesses could ship materials and products more quickly, more reliably, and in greater quantities than ever before. Better transportation encouraged industry to grow even faster. By the middle of the century, extensive fast travel was available even to the poor. Parliament had decreed that certain trains must take passengers for only a penny per mile. Horse-drawn rail cars were first used in coal mines. The steam-powered locomotive was built in 1814. That ran for, at five miles an hour. By the 1850s, trains were averaging around 20 miles per hour. All right, moving on to the Peterloo Massacre. Britain's government claimed to be following a hands-off policy, but in fact it sided openly with factory owners against the workers. It even helped the factory owners crush the workers' attempts to form unions. In Manchester, mounted soldiers charged a peaceful mass of cotton workers and killed several of them in what became known as the Peterloo Massacre of 1819. To many, it seemed that the British society was splitting into two angry camps, the working class who demanded reform, and the ruling classes who fiercely resisted reform. And there is still a plaque marking that massacre. All right, a new generation of Tories emerged in the 1820s and a trickle of reforms began. A law passed in 1824 permitting Britain's first labor unions to organize, and in 1829, the Catholic Emancipation Act restored economic and religious freedoms to Roman Catholics. If you remember to many of our other previous historical discussions, we've talked about the Protestant-Catholic divide. That was really a major part of British politics. So this trickle of reforms grew into a stream following a Whig victory in the election of 1830. The Reform Bill of 1832 brought sweeping changes to British political life. By extending voting rights to the small but important middle class, which of course would be males only, sorry ladies, this law threatened the traditional dominance of land-owning aristocrats in Parliament. Keep in mind, if you owned land, you were rich, and therefore you could have the right to vote, but if you were poor and you did not own any land, you had no right to vote. So when this changed, suddenly a whole heck of a lot more people were poor than there were rich. And so you know they're gonna vote in ways that favor the poor and punish the rich. All right, but probably most importantly, most significantly, um, is that slavery was abolished in 1833 in Britain. If you've ever seen the movie Amazing Grace, which is one of my personal all-time favorites, or having read the book Hero for Humanity, a book that I have uh, read and loved, it is the biography of William Wilberforce and his struggle to free the slaves. It's really a powerful, amazing, moving story. So if you got uh, some free time, you might wanna check out that movie and certainly I would encourage you to find the book and read the book.
we have this idea that the sun never set on the British Empire during this time in history. And that's also a phrase that you will hear mentioned. You'll hear people say in TV shows and movies say things like, well, the sun never sets on the British Empire. During the Romantic Age, Britannia ruled the waves and English ruled much of the land. Great Britain's smashing conquests in the Napoleonic Wars at the beginning of the 19th century, culminating in Nelson's famous victory at Trafalgar, Square, uh, at Trafalgar in 1805, established an undisputed naval supremacy. This, in turn, gave Great Britain control over most of the world's commerce. As British ships traveled throughout the world, they left the language of the mother country in their wake, but also came home from foreign ports laden with cargoes of words from other languages, freighted with the new meanings for English speakers. I love this stuff. This is where I really get a kick, and I love reading books about the entomology of the English language. The biggest and fattest unabridged English dictionaries hold more than 600,000 words. You compare this to German, which has 185,000 words, and then Russian and French, which have 130,000 and 100,000 words, respectively. One reason we have accumulated the world's largest and most varied vocabulary is that English continues to be the most hospitable and democratic language that has ever existed. Unique in the number and variety of its borrowed words, although Anglo-Saxon is the foundation of the English language, more than 70% of our words have been imported from other lands, ancient and modern, far and near. When the travelers went to new countries, they brought back new words, and this happens all the time, and it still occurs even today in our modern language. English just allows for the addition of new words. It is rather unique in terms of world languages in that way. We can just add new words. It's very exciting. All right. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. All right, literary themes of the period. The beginnings of Romanticism are this. The British Romantic writers responded to the climate of their times. Revolution, war, battles, uh, and of course the Industrial Revolution and that age that came from the intellect that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Their new interest in the trials and dreams of the common people and their desire for radical change developed out of the democratic idealism that characterized the early part of the French Revolution. Their deep attachment to nature and to a pure, simple past was a response to the misery and ugliness born of industrialization. Here on the left, we have a, a painting by Caspar David Frederick. It's called Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. It was done in 1818. This is very, uh, it's a good example of the stylistic paintings that went on during this time period. A very clear contrast between light and dark. Um, there are really quite vivid details, but they also get lost in the sweepingness of it. And I am not an art guy, so if I sound like a complete buffoon, I apologize. You've got this immense landscape, clear, pristine, and yet you have this explorer who is clearly on top of a mountain looking out at all of nature. This idea of exploring, this idea of being in the nature itself. Um, although you would not see many hikers wearing clothes like that today, that would have been pretty common for the hikers in that day. On the left here, we have a painting by, I can't believe I forgot in my notes, who is it? It is Blake, William Blake. Yes, I do have it right there. Uh, this is known as English Europe, a prophecy. It was done in 1794. Blake is also a very famous writer and illustrator. And um, it's possible you've seen that famous hand with the lightning bolts spreading out of the fingers before. For the Romantics, the faith in science and reason, which was characteristic of the period before, no longer applied in this world of tyranny and factories. Romanticism, therefore, was characterized by its emphasis on emotion, individualism. It glorified the past and nature. 
And it was partly a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, the aristocratic social and political norms of the Age of Enlightenment and the scientific rationalization of nature. So again, emotion, individualism, and nature. Those are some of the, those are three of the real biggies of this time period. All right, so here is an image. The Romantics would have loved this. They would have sat here all day composing poetry over an image like this. Clouds, this long ago castle, what could have possibly happened there? Their imaginations would have run wild. They would have seen the ivy creeping up the bricks. They would have seen nature actually reclaiming its ground. You can see the hills in the background. And of course, you would be up in a hill or mountain where this former castle existed. This would have appealed to the romantic writers. So ask yourself, does it appeal to you? What about it appeals to you? Many of the ideas that influenced the British romantics, though, first arose on continental Europe well before the turn of the century. Swiss-born writer Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, from 1712 to 1778, and I know that's kind of going back a little ways. We've moved on from there. But, but here's the, where he kind of set the standard. Here's what he wrote. He wrote that man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. Rousseau saw society as a force that throughout history deformed and imprisoned an originally free human nature. The French Revolution, of course, was born of this idea of setting us free, um, and then the Romantics are reclaiming that idea with this idea of freedom and nature and peace and simplicity. So, of course, his ideas influenced both American and French revolutionaries. The American Revolution around this time period, of course, led to the formation of the United States of America. He was an influential thinker and philosopher at that time period. Now we got, and please forgive my pronunciation, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Something like that. A group of later 18th century writers and artists living in the German-speaking Europe began incorporating Rousseau's ideas into poetry, fiction, and drama. The most famous is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He was alive from 1749 to 1832. He found in German literature of the Middle Ages a primitive simplicity, much in keeping with Rousseau's ideas and values. These works, very similar to the Anglo-Saxon Beowulf, which we have read, were filled with myth, adventure, passion. The Romantic movement takes its name from the interest in medieval romances. So that's where we get this idea of romance. Not in, oh, I love you, but in this idea of heroes and dragons and conquering and adventure. That's the way that the term romance is being used here. Johann's works show a new attention to feelings and express an ideal of self-fulfillment and growth through experience. All right, the, age, the Romantic Age in British poetry. And now we're finally getting to the heart of things. Romanticism was a movement that affected not only literature, but also other arts. The music, it produced such brilliant European composers as Beethoven, as Schubert. But of course, there was no one of comparable stature in Britain. In painting, Romanticism influenced the intensely, intensely personal and warmly spontaneous rural landscapes of John Constable. I'm sorry, that's Schubert. There we go. There's John Constable. Again, you can see there's kind of a lightness, a fluffiness to everything. There are detail. There are specific things. There's a boy drinking out of the brook. There's the sheep in the walkway. You can see kind of in the distance, the gate is hanging off a little bit. And just beyond that, a road. And there's just a sweeping scape of size and scale and the immensity of the tree and the distance and the clouds. Um, the vibrant colors, you've got the browns, the greens, the whites, the blues, the grays. I am no, I'm no one who's knowledgeable about art, but 
there is something that clearly can be appreciated about the skill of this art. And then we saw already a little bit by J.M.W. Turner, we saw the Battle of Trafalgar. Here is another one of his paintings. Um, you could just, that, those waves, they just look so real. There's power in them. And you got The storm is clearly past. It's so dark on the left. And the contrast of the white lightness, the blue sky clearing on the right there. Uh, so uh, Turner was uh, uh, alive during 1775 to 1851. So during this time period, there was some music going on. There was some art going on. But for literature, poetry is what Britain is best known for during this Romantic age. Starting us off with Wordsworth and Coolidge. I have trouble with that guy, Wordsworth. All right, on the left, we've seen him a couple times, Wordsworth. On the right, we got Coolidge. Wordsworth was born in 1770, died in 1850. He provided an early statement of the goals of the Romantic poetry in his preface to Lyrical Ballads, which he wrote in 1798. It was a collaboration with his friend, Samuel Taylor Coolidge, who we know from The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Look at this awesome sculpture. Isn't that amazing? Look at the size of that albatross with the rope around his neck. That's a sweet sculpture. All right. The preface defined poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and explain that poetry takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. An emphasis on emotions then was central to the new romantic poetry, emotions. Equally important was the subject matter. The new poetry, said Wordsworth, dealt with incidents and situations from common life. No aristocracy here. Um, Wordsworth's preface spoke about incorporating human passions with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature. So an emphasis on nature would become another important characteristic of British romantic verse. Lyrical ballads was coolly received at first, meaning it wasn't very much liked. Um, but with time, it was regarded as the cornerstone of Britain's romantic age. Also with time, Wordsworth and Coolidge became respected members of Britain's literary establishment. Their political thinking, deeply marked by events in France, grew more conservative, and their literary ideas began to seem less radical than they once had. So time had tempered these men. Taking us to the second generation of Romantic poets. Wordsworth and Coolidge blazed the way for a new generation of British Romantic poets, the so-called second generation of poets, which included George Gordon, also known as Lord Byron. He's the dude with that awesome snake-like hat. Isn't that sweet? And that sweet mustache there? Wish I had a pencil pin mustache. All right, that's different. All right, Percy uh, Bysshe Shelley in the middle and John Keats on the right. Coming of age during the Napoleonic era, these younger poets rebelled even more strongly than did Wordsworth and Coolidge against the British conservatism of the time. All three died abroad after tragically short lives, and their viewpoints were those of dis disillusioned outsiders. All right, moving on to Lord Byron here. His name is George, but his title is Lord. He was, his family would have been, you know, very important. Um, all right, here's an image taken uh, that is inspired by Lord Byron's tale, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. And yes, it's spelled with an E, but really it's like Child Harold, like the little boy Harold. All right, Lord Byron was a member of the House of Lords. Although critics responded unfavorably to his early poetry, Byron persisted and finally achieved success when he published his first two cantos of Child Harold's Pilgrimage in 1812. He was handsome, egotistical, aloof, and distant. Byron became the darling of elegant society, but not for long because he had affair after fair after fair, scandalous love affairs, and so all of the wives of London stopped inviting him to their parties. He eventually left Britain, kind of under the shadow of shame in 1816, and he never returned back. 
Percy Bysshe Shelley, Byron's friend Shelley, who was alive from 1792 to 1822, was also an aristocrat and political radical, more consistently radical, in fact, than Byron. In poems, such as Song to the Men of England in 1819, Shelley urged England's lower classes to rebel. Like Byron, Shelley was shunned for his radical ideas. He left Britain for good in 1818, which is an important year, and we'll get to that very soon. In his lifetime, he did not attain the fame that Byron did, yet he is now remembered for the fervor he brought to lyric poetry in such intensely personal and emotional verses as To a Skylark. I promise we're getting close to the end. John Keats. Keats was alive from 1795 to 1821. He is the third great figure in the second generation of Romantic poets. He was also a master of lyric poetry. Unlike Byron and Shelley, Keats was born outside upper-class society, the son of a London stablekeeper. So he was sort of the lower class. Keats trained to be a doctor, but abandoned his medical career to pursue his passion for poetry, which is kind of an odd thing to do, even in today's world where that's more acceptable. Not a lot of people make a living being a poet. He produced many of his greatest poems in a burst of creativity during the first nine months of 1819. Works like The Fall of Hyperion and Ode on a Grecian Urn. In many of these poems, Keats tried to reconcile the eternal and therefore almost inhuman beauty of art with the realities of human suffering. How can we have such beautiful art and such sad, depressing suffering? The famous line at the end of Ode on a Grecian Urn, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, represents one response to this dilemma, but it is not a final answer for Keats. Unfortunately, Keats contracted tuberculosis. Hoping to recuperate in a warmer climate, he traveled to Italy, where he died at the age of 25. Poetry was the dominant literary form during the Romantic Age, but many significant prose works also appeared, mainly in the form of essays and novels. This was a dry period for drama. Only two theaters were licensed to produce plays, and they tended to feature popular spectacles rather than serious plays. However, Byron and Shelley did write closet dramas or verse works intended to be read rather than produced on stage, meaning uh, they were like scripts. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Mary Shelley. So unlike the Romantic poets, the novelists of the Romantic age did not make a sharp break with the past. The Gothic novel first appeared in the middle of the 18th century. It featured a number of standard ingredients, including brave heroes and heroines, threatening scoundrels, vast eerie castles, ghosts. The fascination of the romantics with mystery and the supernatural made such novels quite popular during the Romantic Age. One of the most successful was Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. And just to be clear, that is the official title of the book, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. It was written by Piercy Bisbee Shelley's wife, Mary Wollstonecraft, who, once she married, became Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. All right, finishing up here with Romantic period novels. The Romantic novel of manners continued in the tradition of earlier writers by turning a satirical eye on British customs. The most highly regarded writer of novels of manners was Jane Austen. She lived from 1775 to 1817. She, of course, wrote Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, some of her most famous works. Her incisive portrayals of character and her social satire are more reflective of the classical sensibility of the 18th century than of the notions of the new Romantic age. So, very quickly, to summarize, the Romantic period was a revolt against industrialization, 
It was influenced by the French Revolution, overthrowing of the aristocracy, the democratization of living, allowing the lower classes, the middle classes, more power. And of course, a focus on the individual, a focus on nature, uh, a focus on the past and better times and better worlds. So that is the Romantic period in a nutshell.